We are following breaking news in Las Vegas, where multiple people are dead after a shooting on the campus of UNLV. According to police, the shooter is deceased, but we don't know whether police killed the suspect or if they died by suicide. And we also don't know about a possible motive. We do know a number of innocent people were hurt, killed, and traumatized while trying to learn and study at college. Law enforcement sources tell NBC News at least three people are dead. We have been waiting for a press conference to start. They are walking out right now. This is the Las Vegas Police Department. We'll listen in on this. Good evening. Thanks for coming. My name is Kevin McMahill, and I'm the sheriff of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. First, I would like to reiterate to all of you that there is no more ongoing threat to our community here in Las Vegas. I also like to tell you that we do know the identity of the suspect in this case, but I will not be releasing his name tonight until after the next of kin notification. As you all know, of course, this is a tragic day for all of us in Southern Nevada. And at approximately 11.45 a.m., LVMPD dispatch received reports of an active shooter at the UNLV campus. UNL campus UNLV campus police responded to the scene and engaged the suspect immediately right outside of Beam Hall. LVMPD officers also responded simultaneously. I can tell you today, three of the victims are confirmed deceased. There is a fourth victim who suffered a gunshot wound and is now currently in Sunrise Hospital, upgraded to stable condition. In addition to that, there were four additional people who were transported from the scene to nearby hospitals suffering from panic attacks. Two of our officers were treated at UMC for minor injuries, which were received while searching the vast rooms and buildings for victims at UNLV. Our hearts go out to the entire UNLV community. No student should have to fear pursue, pursuing their dreams on the college campus. What happened today is a heinous, unforgivable crime. But I want you all to know something. It's a crime that we train for each and every day. When there is an active shooter threat, the men and women of the Southern Nevada first responder community, police, fire, and EMS come together to respond quickly and decisively with zero hesitation. Within minutes, both on and off duty responders race to the campus to prevent further loss of life. On a personal note, I'll tell you that after one October and all the time and effort and energy that we've put together in training with the men and women of law enforcement, the fire service, and EMS, watching how seamlessly they work together today made me very, very proud to be their sheriff. Importantly, there was a gathering just outside of the building where the students were playing games and eating food. There were tables set up for them to build Legos. And if it hadn't been for the her heroic actions of one of those police officers who responded, there could have been countless additional lives taken. Armed confrontation of the suspect by law enforcement stopped the suspect's further actions. I'm proud of the courage of these officers and the UNLV campus police and how they demonstrated that today. And with that, I'm going to introduce the governor of the great state of Nevada, Joe Lombardo. Governor. Thank you. Kevin, thank you. Uh, thank you for your opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I think it's important for people to realize the partnership that is formed as a result of my career at LVMPD and with Kevin, the sheriff himself, and the, the confidence that I was assured of uh, when I got notified today. I had no doubt that the response would be appropriate, it would be swift, it would be quick to the satisfaction of all the naysayers that we normally experience during critical incidents. And today, um, LVMPD did a fantastic job, along with the University PD did a fantastic job. And after the after action is settled here and our concern for the victims um, are bolstered and satisfied, um, I, I will be uh, 
absolutely proud of the response of the first responders. I'll be absolutely proud of the community of UNLV, and I'll be absolutely proud of the community of Las Vegas and the state of Nevada. Um, I had some formal comments to be said, but the important piece is I'm here to show the solidarity between the community and the law enforcement community and ensure on behalf of the state of Nevada, um, we are here to help um, provide resources to the benefit of the victims and to um, express my concern for the victims and favorable thoughts to the families and to ensure that uh, we move forward as a society and as a community and to assure the community uh, we are doing everything within our uh, ability to address these situations uh, appropriately and um, with the knowledge that we have received on a continual basis. So, Kevin, thank you. thank you. I appreciate that. And I think it's appropriate that the chief of UPD uh, comes up and says a few words in um, the positive response of his police department. So, uh, Chief Alex Garcia, please. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Adam Garcia. I'm the university police chief. Uh, first of all, let me begin by uh, telling you all uh, how heartbroken we are on our campus for what happened today. On behalf of the chancellor, the board of regents, and uh, President Whitfield, uh, I am passing along our profound sense of loss for what occurred in the loss of life that took place. As the sheriff said, uh, our officers uh, collectively, uh, UPD as well as Metro, responded to call for shots fired approximately 11.45. Uh, two uh, of our detectives responded to the scene and immediately engaged uh, the suspect in a shootout. Uh, the suspect was struck and uh, is deceased at this time. The campus uh, was almost immediately closed and out of an abundance of caution, all Nevada system of higher education institutions in Southern Nevada were as well closed. UNLV will remain closed for the remainder of today, tomorrow and Friday and uh, additional uh, determinations will be made as to whether or not the school, the university will reopen uh, next week, which will be finals week. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Commissioner Gibson. Thank you, Chief. I'm Jim Gibson, the chairman of the Clark County Commission, and I'm here to express the uh, shock that we all felt as a community, but at the same time, the enormous relief that we feel as a result of the great work of the first responders. We want everyone to know that anyone who has been affected will have the resources available to them to ensure that they have uh, an opportunity and a way, a pathway to work through whatever the effects have been. My colleagues on the County Commission, indeed all of us in Clark County, express our support to the university and the uh, folks who've been affected over there. We know that this will not know the uh, entirety of the effect of all of this for some time. But the one thing that is certain, which was spoken, I think, uh, a few minutes ago, is that without the uh, incredibly well-trained and effective response that was provided, a whole lot worse situation could have happened. For those who uh, suffer loss under the circumstances, the worst has happened for them. And as a community, we need to make sure that we're mindful of them. We need to keep them in our prayers, and we need to respond in every other way that we possibly can in order to meet the needs that are so great at this time, this kind of a thing, and at this time in our lives here in this county. And now I would turn it over, the, time, the uh, microphone over to Chief Steinbeck, who will talk just a little bit about what some of the resources are that are available. Chief. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate it. Um, Adam, great job. Thank you very much, and uh, great job by uh, LVMPD and certainly uh, all the participating agencies there. 
Uh, yes, immediately we started to go ahead and we had um, people that there aren't there on scene start to build up the resources for the recovery. Recovery starts um, actually before the incident even begins and certainly as the incident unfolds. Uh, so we do have uh, over at the um, Las Vegas Convention Center in the North Hall, uh, we have opened up a family assistance center there. Uh, it's similar to the one that we opened up after 1 October, obviously smaller in scale but uh, ready to provide many of the same services, which include behavioral health services. UNLV has student services there. Um, we have uh, religious leaders there, uh, um, Legal Aid of Nevada is there, uh, any resources that, that we might find necessary, um, whether they're immediate or in the long term, as the commissioner said. Also at the, uh, at the um, Vegas um, Justice and Resiliency Center, uh, that'll be open. That That is the center that was opened up following 1 October, a long-term resiliency center. That is also ready to assist those in need and will uh, take over the long-term uh, recovery operation uh, following the immediate reunification and the services that are provided at the Family Assistance Center. Um, you can access those services in person or online. And uh, the online is uh, at the uh, FAC, which stands for Family Assistance Center, FAC of SouthernNevada.org. You can also call 211, in which you'll be directed over to uh, the call center, or the direct call to the call center is 702-455, AIDE AID, or 702-455-2433. And so um, those numbers are available for, for all those services. Again, uh, as was spoken before, hearts go out to the families. Certainly wasn't lost uh, there on the scene after it, the, um, it was uh, de-escalating. That, uh, that college means a lot to us, right? And that's where I went, that's where my wife went, that's where my children went. So uh, hearts go out to UNLV and certainly uh, any of the uh, families of the people that have been um, affected by this. Thank you. Carolyn Goodman, Mayor of the City of Las Vegas. And after all these years and the tragedies that have happened around our country, but right here, it's something for those, the families that we've lost, who've had this tragedy, bespeak everything that is not good about our country, what's wrong and how we have to teach our children to handle stress and be able to work through anger and hate in other ways. I don't have the particulars of who we have lost. I think this is all with the sheriff. I know our first responders were incredible. All facets of law enforcement immediately pulling together, and I'm so grateful and proud of them. I do have someone very close to me who was out on the campus at the time and want to commend the security out at UNLV for their instantaneous reaction and calming those who could be calmed and making the, lot, the lockdown bearable with all that fear, the fear that permeated every one of those children, every one of those professors. It's a very difficult time, and it's time for us as the adults. Enough. It is enough, and it is people filled with anger or not understanding how to handle disappointment in their lives that they become even more hateful and full of anger and take lives of others. So my condolences on behalf of the entire city um, and the community to those we've lost, those families that are so distraught and lost today and in the future. And Sheriff, I must commend you, and Sheriff, former Sheriff Lombardo, you did set this up. And Sheriff, thank you, what a tragic time for us. But it's a time to make it a positive and do something. We must fix this now. And allowing me to speak, thank you, Sheriff. And congratulations. 
Thank you. As soon as I listened to the, the comments of the other speakers, it took me back to um, when the sheriff and or the under sheriff and I were over at the scene and, and watching as we had to go through floor by floor, room by room, building by building. And I've seen some of the commentary about how long this has taken. Um, but just like in one October, numerous other calls were coming in about different shootings that were occurring. We're having to breach every single door. We're finding groups of students that were huddled. It took us a long time to evacuate and then recheck. Um, we will be conducting this investigation into the wee hours of the morning, there is no doubt. I know you have an insatiable appetite like I do to find out why, um, to understand motivation, and we will provide that to you at the appropriate time. But with that being said, um, I'd just like to end on the fact that we watched a lot of fear across the faces of those young men and women at UNLV today. And it's unfortunate that they had to live through that. But again, I'm proud of that first responder community for getting over there and doing that. So with that, I'll take a couple of questions. I'm so you have to tell me who's talking. I can't see. Hi, Dana. Can you tell us anything about the weapon or weapons that were used? Um, not yet, Dana. I just want to reserve until I have a little bit better information on, on exactly what was used. We haven't moved the body yet. I don't have any details on the weapon yet, but we will provide that to you. Channel 8 News, KLAS. What's the affiliation of the victims to UNLV? Were there students, professors, staff? Um, I'm not prepared to release that information yet either. I, I, like I said, I know you guys are, are hungry for that, um, but we haven't been able to run each and every one of those leads down, and I don't want to provide you misinformation at that. Ricardo, last one. Did the shooting originate outside, or did it begin outside, and about how long were shots fired? It originated on the fourth floor of that beam building, um, went to multiple floors, and the suspect was neutralized on the outside uh, by the UNLV Police Department. So we'll be providing you the next uh, news conference information as we get it. Thanks for coming. Sure. Sure. Can you, can you... And we were just listening there to an update on the shooting on the UNLV College campus from officials in Las Vegas, Nevada. According to what police and other officials said in that press conference, three people are dead, one hospitalized, injured uh, by gunshots, but now in stable condition. The suspect, they say, is also deceased. According to police at 1145, they got a call reporting shots fired on the campus of UNLV. They say that two officers arrived and immediately engaged the shooter. The police withholding that suspect's name, only saying that there is no threat to the community right now. NBC News, according to three law enforcement sources familiar with the investigation, uh, has been told that the suspect in this is a male in his 60s. I want to bring in NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz, who is here with me following these developments. Liz, listening in to that press conference, what stood out to you? And in terms of the TikTok of how and why all of this happened, what do we know? So I think for me, what you mentioned, Allison, the fact that police essentially are saying that it sounds like they confronted the gunman and that it was perhaps one of their shots that hit the gunman, stopped him, and also it sounds like killed him. We didn't get a, a lot of details on it, but I think that that uh, is, is what law enforcement was saying happened. They really were uh, praising the first responders who showed up within minutes and they say were able to stop the gunmen because they, the police was saying that there was a gathering of students right there outside of Beam Hall and that it could have been much worse. They were playing games, they were eating, and that if law enforcement had not showed up so quickly, it really, really could have been much worse. Um, as you mentioned, though, uh, we did get the uh, info from police that there were three people who have died. One person is in the hospital. We we had been told critical condition, but now updated to stable condition. So that is uh, good news. And then there have been four additional people who were transported to the hospital because of panic attacks. And that was made very clear that these law enforcement officials say they found so many terrified college students hiding in their classrooms for hours as this all unfolded. Let's talk a little more about the victims here. And we don't have a lot of information on names or if they were students or teachers. That stuff we're still waiting to hear. But as I understand it, I think I read this college itself. It's a large school, something like 30,000 plus students and staff. 
the stories that we have heard today from students about what they've witnessed, the trauma they've experienced, what, what have they been saying as they've been trying to process this and really just survive? I mean, do we know how long they were in lockdown? It sounds like even up until moments ago, some of the buildings were still being evacuated. The latest update from the university is that there is still a shelter in place. And so there are many students that I think for hours were were hunkered down in their classrooms as this as police went building to building, evacuating people. And what we've heard is sadly what we've heard over and over again from people who have been uh, caught up or victims of, of mass shootings just there is just the terror of hearing the gunshots. Someone said that they, a professor told NBC News that it sounded like they went off for about 30 seconds. Um, and, and just the sheer terror, people texting their parents, texting their loved ones. It's just trauma that a professor even said uh, is going to last, you know, trauma that's going to stick with these people for their life, for these young people for their lives. You have covered a lot of events like this. For you as a reporter, when you're looking into the hours and days ahead and the information is changing, what are the key questions that you're going to be watching for, hoping to find answers in the coming days and hours? Well, I think the question we all have right now, and, and the chief alluded to it, said it, is that we all want to know exactly what was the motive here. Who is this person? This was a man in his 60s, this gunman. We do not know if this was a student. Was this a professor? We do not know the connection to the university. So that's, of course, going to be a really big question. Um, but then of course, understanding and, and centering the victims here and, and their stories and who they are, because this could be potentially three young people, three professors. We don't know the victims, but three people lost their lives today. One person's in the hospital. It's just horrible, and it, and it continues to happen, and you and I both continue to cover these stories. All right, Liz, stay with us. I want to bring in NBC News terrorism analyst Jim Cavanaugh, a former special agent in charge for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosive. Jim, let me ask you, as someone from the law enforcement side of things, when you're looking at a situation like this, the coming hours, the coming days, what are the key questions for you that still need to be answered, and how how quickly do you think we could get some of those answers? Well, they're going to start unraveling tonight, Ellison. I, I have the similar questions you and Liv's have, of course. Motive. Uh, I want to know about the weapon, you know, how he acquired it, what was his purpose, were there any co-conspirators. I think we're going to un see unfold tonight a search at his residence uh, with a search warrant. Uh, federal and uh, state and local officers all conducting a search seeing if there's a note uh, sweeping his electronics, laptop, a phone, and so forth. Is there any, um, you know, letter left, suicide note, manifesto, reason he might have done it? And also, you know, did he hurt anybody at his residence? Sometimes these killers will kill their wife, or, uh, their parents, a, a roommate, and then go do uh, a spree killing. I would also just add that, you know, you're, it's important to talk about, you know, why this happened and who he was. But in motive, we always look at targeting. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems to me, as first blush, as a commander, when I was looking at this, I'd say the shooting started on the fourth floor of the Beam building. Mm -hmm. When yet there's students out front playing Legos and, you know, uh, uh, relaxing on the uh, grassy outside of the campus. So if he's just a man who wants to kill people at the college, why not shoot the people outside or the people on the first floor? Why did he begin the shooting on the fourth floor? So that would make me want to look at what's the purpose and reason he went to that location. Uh, was he connected to it uh, like you offered? Was he a student, a faculty member? You know, did he fail a class there? Is there some connection there? And there may be because it started you know, deep inside the university it, rather than in, in just a public place. Typically, when you're looking at something like this, Jim, where it happened quickly, the suspect is now deceased, and we're talking about such a large campus, such a big area of students, from the law enforcement standpoint, how difficult is it to get in and actually start locking down, collecting evidence on the crime scene, when in theory it could be the entire campus? I mean, will they consider the entire campus the crime scene here as they're trying to retrace every step? I think they have done that already, Ellison. I think they're down now to the Beam building and the immediate out front of there where the two university police detectives killed the shooter. Uh, you know, this is why we have to have, and we do have, such professional university and campus police. Uh, they can respond quickly. They know the area. They know the buildings. They know how to get in and out and through the crevices. And our specialty police, you know, our 
university police, our hospital police, our, you know, bridge and tunnel police, and subway and transit police, port authority police, uh, often become the the officers who are engaged with these uh, killers right away, because that's where people gather and live, and that's where killers go. So without the University of Nevada police, these two detectives being able to be there so promptly, I think, you know, this guy could have rampaged across that campus, uh, you know, killing students outside, maybe entering another building. Uh, maybe it wasn't over. I mean, if he wanted to commit suicide after he shot the people in the building, he certainly did not. So I would think his killing was going to be ongoing until he was encountered by those two university police detectives. Liz, let me bring you back in here because, you know, every time we have one of these mass shootings, whether it's at a school, whether it's at a shopping center, the question people always turn to is what could have been done to prevent it and what, if anything, can be done moving forward. We have seen the United States Congress really almost at a stalemate for a good three plus decades on the issue of guns. You had a bit of movement following the Uvalde shooting in 2022, where they did pass some bipartisan law that would help to address in some ways red flag laws on the state level. But really that's about it. Are we starting to hear the calls from people in this community to say, hey, what can be done? And realistically, is this gonna be the thing that changes it or or where, we, where do we go from here? Right, and that is always the question. Mm -hmm. And you always have people on one side saying we need to speak about gun control and access to guns and firearms right away. And then you have others who say, oh, it's too soon. Let's, it's too soon to have that political discussion. We did hear the mayor at the press conference just now talk about how something needs to be done. And, and you could see the emotion as she said that, because remember... Las Vegas is the site of the deadliest mass shooting in U.S. history. 59 people died at the uh, Harvest Music Festival, right, in Las Vegas. 500 people injured. So this is a city that understands and knows very well what gun violence can do and the trauma of these mass shootings. And this shooting that happened today at the university, just four miles from the site, of the Harvest Music Festival shooting. We've seen President Biden give a statement as well, whether or not this moves the needle. Remember there was the shooting last month in Maine, mm -hmm. uh, and we see these shootings over and over, and it, it doesn't really seem like Congress acts. And the president was previously planning to visit Las Vegas. Yes, this is, week. Do and we he, know if that's still gonna happen? Yeah, as of now, it, we understand that he's still planning to visit. Okay, and that will be Friday, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. It was initially going to be to discuss infrastructure, I think could be changing now, but he does still plan yeah. to visit. Okay, NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz, thank you so much, and thank you, Jim Cavanaugh. We appreciate your expertise and insight. The Pacific Northwest knows a thing or two about rain, but this week's downpours are rewriting the record books. An atmospheric river has left a trail of overflowing rivers, mudslides, power outages, and death. Two people are believed to have drowned in creeks in Oregon. In just 48 hours, Seattle saw 3.75 inches of rain, breaking a daily rainfall record. The Portland area got even more. The good news, rivers are going down. The bad Another atmospheric river is on the way. NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens is standing by with the forecast, but we begin with NBC's Miguel Almaguer tracking the damage left by round one. Loaded and bustling. Tonight, many of the rivers, streams, and creeks that carve through the Pacific Northwest are bursting at the seams, fueled by days of relentless rain. The dangerous, fast-moving torrents are leaving some 8 million people in the region under flood alerts. Across Washington, emergency teams race from rescue to rescue. The Coast Guard plucking one driver to safety, then hoisting a family from their home, which was suddenly surrounded by four feet of rising water. Today, an hour outside Seattle. The damage has been done to some homes in Granite Falls. I put a lot of time and effort in this, and it just took one thing to take it all away. The deluge which triggered the flooding, the first of three atmospheric rivers, dumping several inches of rain in the region's biggest cities. It's Creston now. Outside Portland, authorities fear at least two people were swept away by powerful currents when flash flooding turned deadly. How would you feel if you watch your best friend go in and in the water and you couldn't know about it? With up to 10 inches of rain expected to fall by tomorrow, today's reprieve from the next system will be short-lived. 
The water's rising high, and um, we're getting ready to get out. A region desperate to dry out, now finding itself in the bullseye of yet another storm. Believe it or not, the floodwaters here are expected to eventually recede, and the rain should stop. But as we mentioned, another weather maker is on the way. Back to you. Now for the forecast. NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens is tracking the wet weather. Bill, good evening. Well, good evening to you, Ellison. And the Pacific Northwest is in cleanup mode. A lot of the worst flooding is over with, and flood watches have actually been dropped for the Portland and Seattle area. So that's great news. We still have isolated chances of flooding going from about the central Oregon coastline, Coos Bay southwards into the coastal areas of Northern California. But even these will be dropped a little later as a bulk of the heaviest rain is now exiting. We still have a couple rivers that are in flood stage, but all of them are crested at this point and they're going down. So in other words, we do not expect any additional damage. So here goes our first storm. And you can even see now we're getting some rain and snow in the high elevations here of the central Sierra Mountains in California. There's the storm that's going to come in tomorrow, just a little bit of rain. And then there's the one behind that as we head towards Friday night and Saturday. So still an active weather pattern for the West Coast and especially in the Northwest, but it's not going to be as strong as the last two storms. The story as we head towards tomorrow, as our storm system in the West moves east, it's bringing a lot of warm weather with it. We're going to see temperatures into the 60s as far north as North Dakota. We're going to break record high tomorrow, Grand Fork. Minneapolis come close. Omaha should come close. Same with you in North Platte. You get the idea here. It's going to feel like springtime throughout all of the northern plains. You know, typically you can even talk about blizzards this time of year. We're not even close to that. Then by Friday, Chicago, 55 degrees. Kansas City, 57. So, you know, there's a light jacket weather. You don't even need the gloves. 62 in St. Louis. And then ahead of that storm system on Sunday, a very warm day at the East Coast. Richmond, 67. New York City, 61. Charleston, at 72 degrees. Even a little bit humid humid with that. So here's the timing of that storm. As we go through Friday, it's still kind of weak. Then we take the storm, we push it into the middle of the country. It taps some of the moisture from the Gulf of Mexico. Saturday is the day it gets a lot stronger, adds that moisture to it. We get the thunderstorms and additional rain. So Saturday afternoon and evening, these are all thunderstorms from Houston to Memphis, maybe Nashville, Jackson, Mississippi, Tupelo. All areas will be watching. Chance for some severe weather. Damaging wind gusts looks to be the biggest culprit. And then on Sunday, what a mess for the East Coast. Up and down the East Coast, a line of strong showers, thunderstorms at time, gusty winds will be blowing through the region. On the very backside, there'll be a little bit of snow, but I think one of the biggest problems is going to be those coastal winds could gust 50 to 70 miles per hour. So here's that area that could see severe weather Saturday. That's Houston, Little Rock, Memphis included in that, Shreveport, Alexandria, and rainfall. Watch out, my friends, especially in northern New England. There's a good deal of snow in the ground. Northern Adirondacks, the white and the green mountains, Vermont, New Hampshire, up into Maine, and a lot of that's going to melt because it's going to get very warm, and we're going to get the heavy rain with it. So here's the Friday outlook. By the time we get to Saturday, there is that next storm coming into the northwest. Again, minor problems with that. Sunday is that ugly day on the east coast as we remain wet in the northwest. A very active weather pattern, Allison, as we head into the middle of December. Bill Karens, thank you. Tonight, all eyes are on Han Yunus, southern Gaza's largest city, as Israeli troops say they are advancing on the area in an attempt to root out Hamas militants, which they say are in that area. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said troops have surrounded the home of a Hamas leader. The Israeli military says they believe Yahya Senwar, the man responsible, allegedly, for most of Gaza's day-to-day -day governance and also, according to the Israeli military, the person who helped orchestrate the terror attack on October 7th, is currently inside that home. Meanwhile, thousands of civilians are attempting to leave Hans Yunus to avoid getting caught in the crossfire. But with Israeli airstrikes coming down fast, some aren't so lucky. Wounded children have packed the emergency room at Nasser Hospital in Han Yunus. Medics there say supplies are running out. Today, children were seen running through the hospital's hallways in the hopes of finding their families. One tearful reunion was captured on video. Take a look. The United Nations is calling the situation on the ground in Gaza apocalyptic, leading to the UN Secretary General calling on the Security Council to declare an immediate ceasefire under a rarely invoked rule known as Article 99. 
NBC's Hala Garani joins us now from Tel Aviv. Hala, what can you tell us about the troop movements on the ground, particularly in and around the area of Han Yunus? So the Israeli military says they are deep into the southern Gaza Strip, including in and around Khan Yunus, which is one of the largest cities in Gaza. They have said that they believe it is the command center of Hamas. Yahya Sinwar, the leader of Hamas, had his home encircled by the Israeli military. Uh, that announcement was made, though the probability, of course, that Yahya Sinwar is sitting in his house and Khan Yunus waiting for the IDF is uh, pretty much zero. The Israeli military is releasing an image as well showing uh, top commanders, top Hamas commanders uh, with the circles drawn over their faces saying that these are the commanders that they have killed so far in this military operation. This, of course, is part of the information war as well, probably more directed at the Israeli public than at Palestinians, showing that this uh, operation has yielded results, uh, trying to send that message perhaps to Israelis as uh, this conflict enters its eighth week. Ellison. And Hala, you mentioned Yahya Senwar. Can you explain for viewers a little more mm -hmm. about his history and his role within Hamas? So he took over Hamas a few years ago in 2017. He was in an Israeli prison for 22 years. He was convicted of abducting and killing two Israeli soldiers. He was released in 2011 as part of a prisoner swap uh, in exchange for one Israeli soldier, Gilad Shalit. More than a thousand Palestinians were exchanged for Gilad Shalit, who was taken in 2006. And he's somebody that the Israelis claim is basically the architect architect of the October 7th attack uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the though the as I mentioned the probability that he's still in Khan Yunus in his home uh, is, is is pretty much zero mm -hmm. the Israeli government says it's only a matter of time before they catch him Ellison mm -hmm. so Hala let's talk about what is happening to the people of Gaza right now there were massive mm -hmm. amounts of shortages of fuel, water, food, all of it in Gaza. And before the pause, aid groups were already saying, even as the Rafah border crossing opened to allow humanitarian aid in, every day saying that this is really, in terms of supplies, what we need. It is a drop in the ocean of need. Is any aid getting in right now? So not uh, in any way that is going to be making a difference as far as the humanitarian needs are concerned. And in the last few days, a, aid agencies are saying nothing that they need is making it across the southern border from Rafa on the uh, from the Egyptian side uh, into Rafa on the southern border. It's difficult to overstate, Ellison, how dire the humanitarian situation is. First of all, the displacement of half of the population from the north to the south, putting an immense amount of pressure on the infrastructure. There is no clean water in many places, no uh, shelter. It's now much colder in this part of the world. It has been raining all day. You can imagine the situation for people in tents and flimsy, uh, uh, sort of uh, fl fl flimsy uh, accommodation that they are having to put up in some of these makeshift refugee camps. And then there is the continued bombing of places like Rafa that is causing still major issues for the population there and putting more pressure on the hospital system that is already at breaking point. All of this, as in the north, we are being told there is a complete collapse of the medical system there, Alison. Mm. Hala Garani, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Tonight in Alabama, four White House hopefuls are facing off at the fourth Republican presidential debate. The primary's frontrunner, former President Donald Trump, is noticeably absent from the debate stage. But not surprisingly, he's taken up most of the oxygen. That's because of these comments he made last night on Fox News, in which he suggested if he was reelected, he'd rule as a dictator. But only on day one, not after that. This is not hyperbole or some cynical spin. Take a listen for yourself. Under no circumstances, you are promising America tonight you would never abuse power as retribution against anybody. Except for day one. Yeah. Except Look, what? He's going to prison. Except for day one. Meaning? I want to close the border and I want to drill. That's drill, not a that's, drill. That's not, no, no. that's not retribution. I got I'm going to be, I'm going to be, you know, he keeps, 
<laughs> we love this guy. He says, you're not going to be a dictator, are you? I said, no, 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 other than day one. Let's go to NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitali, who is live in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So, Ali, let's start with those comments from former President Donald Trump. What has been the blowback so far, if any? Well, look, the debate is going on as we speak, and I'm coming to you from the spin room, Allison, so I'm going to be slightly more quiet as my colleagues continue to listen to the exchanges that are being piped in all around me, but certainly Trump's not here, but those comments about being a dictator, if only for one day, are certainly shaping the debate, a stark reminder of the fact that he doesn't have to be here in person to still be a key part of setting the narrative for the people who are also hoping to succeed him as the nominee of their party. The only person to really speak directly to that, though, at this point, is former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, who has shaped his entire campaign as one of truth-telling against the former president, someone who he was closely allied with throughout the time that Trump was in office. Christie here saying that he believed Trump at his word when Trump said that he would be a dictator, and that Christie thinks that it was a rare moment of Trump actually telling the truth. Beyond that, though, we have not heard much contrast from his co from the others on the stage, including Haley Ramaswamy and and DeSantis. Ali Biden also made some notable remarks yesterday. What is going on there? That's exactly right, saying that he wouldn't be running if Trump weren't running because Trump needs to be beaten. Now, many have said that Biden shouldn't have said that because it gives more power to Trump's argument of electability. And now we see the president seeming to walk those comments back. Listen to what he said. Absolutely. Would you be running for I expect so, but look, he is running, and I just, I have to run. Did you drop out of Trump right now? No, not now. So Biden making clear there that his campaign is not ostensibly linked to Trump. It's not one for one in the way that that reporter was asking. But of course, we know from 2020 that the entire ethos of Biden's campaign was the battle for the soul of a nation against the former president. Now it seems like he might be trying to revive that, sometimes to the chagrin of his own party for the way in which he said it yesterday. Ali, before we let you go, what has been happening on that debate stage? Any fireworks people should know about? Yeah, we have seen some fiery moments here, Ellison. I think the one thing that's clear, and the Haley campaign said this to me before they got on the debate stage tonight, is that she is really the candidate with a target on her back because of the way she's been surging in the polls, because of the way that donors seem to be coming to her cause this 40 days away from the Iowa caucus. It really is do or die time. And you look at the candidates on this stage, frankly, if you had watched no other debate and knew nothing else about this race, you could tell that Haley was the one to beat just by the sheer amount of criticism and attacks that she's been facing from her opponents on this stage. Ramaswamy, of course, a regular agitator of Haley's. We've seen them spar over this. We've also seen former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie almost come to Haley's defense, saying that Ramaswamy was only attacking her on personality traits as opposed to policy and trying to almost come to her aid in that way. It's a really fascinating way of looking at the landscape of the stage, really the smallest that we've ever seen despite the reality that the person who they all have to beat is not on that stage, that's Trump, and he still remains far ahead of everyone who's there, even as they spar amongst themselves for a second, Ellison. <laughs> Ali Vitali in Alabama, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Don't go anywhere because we are just getting started. The temperature is dropping in Chicago and hundreds of migrants have nowhere to sleep. It's not helping that the mayor and the governor are not on the same page in terms of how to deal with the crisis. Plus, New Mexico is suing Instagram's parent company and Mark Zuckerberg for failing to protect children. We'll tell you what the suit is alleging. Welcome back. Here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. The Justice Department has charged four Russian soldiers with war crimes in connection with the war in Ukraine. The four allegedly abducted and tortured an American victim and threatened to kill him. The charges are pretty much symbolic right now because of the four fugitives, they are still on the run. Today, the Colorado Supreme Court heard oral arguments in a case that aims to keep former President Donald Trump off the state's ballot. A group of voters argue that Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election results and his actions during January 6th violate the 14th Amendment and should make him ineligible for office. 
Congressman Kevin McCarthy is leaving office at the end of this year. He announced the news in both the Wall Street Journal and in an X video saying that he plans to pursue his passion in a, quote, new arena. Famous TV writer and producer Norman Lear has passed away. Lear's career spanned over six decades as he created and developed some of the most iconic comedies like All in the Family and Sanford and Son. He was 101 years old. And it may have been a cruel summer, but winter is looking pretty good for Taylor Swift as she's just been named Person of the Year by Time Magazine. It's been a year of big achievements for Swift. Her era's tour revitalized local economies, her concert film shattered box office records, and she was just named Spotify's most streamed artist this year. Intense friction tonight in Chicago as the city tries to figure out how and where to place hundreds of migrants. Earlier this week, Governor J.B. Pritzker said they were halting construction on a potential new shelter, citing toxicity and environmental concerns, something the mayor's office initially insisted was still safe. Now, as the weather gets colder in the Windy City, hundreds are left with nowhere to go. Let's bring in NBC News Now correspondent Maura Barrett. Maura... Break this down for us. It seems like Governor Pritzker and Chicago's mayor are sort of at a standstill at odds disagreeing on what to do. Is that right? Yeah, Allison, there's been a lot of open tension between Chicago's mayor and the state governor here uh, between how to move forward on housing the influx of migrants that have been coming into Chicago over the last month, more than 80 buses just in the last month alone. The city saying they're expecting even more based on what they're seeing coming up from Texas. And this migrant uh, tent camp essentially was going to be a winterized version in Brighton Park that could house up to 2,000 migrants. So it's something that the city very much needs. Uh, but the issue here is like you mentioned this toxicity report that came back because this site used to be home to a lot of industrial work and so uh, when they went and investigated it researchers found uh, metals like lead uh, cyanide other pesticides as well as some cancer causing compounds and so while they said the city officials said that they went and removed and disposed of a lot of these issues they said it was still safe but the governor said hey I'm not willing to put migrant families that are risking their lives coming across the country like this to then be placed in a in a toxic Toxic, not safe environment. So that's kind of how all of that unfolded, Allison. So, Mara, where do these people go? I mean, they need somewhere to sleep, somewhere that's safe. It's so cold where you are. Are other groups stepping in to help? That's exactly the case. And so for a while, thousands of migrants were held at police stations like this one. But as the city is trying to clear out the stations ahead of the winter season into other shelters, uh, we're running into this standstill because they were supposed to get migrants into shelters by the middle of December. That's just about now. Uh, but they, and they do have some shelters in place, but it's just not enough for the migrants that we're seeing coming in. And so there is an alliance between the city and faith-based organizations where the churches are stepping up to help. We spent the day uh, with Pastor John Zayas. He's leading the charge with his Grace and Peace Church. I want you to hear a little bit about their goal and how they're helping these migrants. We felt like we just didn't want just to house them. We want to give them hope and kind of move them on. And so we approached the city of Chicago with an idea. And so with the mayor's office, we developed a 60-day um, uh, plan to make sure that we can work through families in 60 days. So the church would shelter them, would walk through a process with them, you know, give them hope, vision, purpose, those types of things. And this has been a successful model so far, especially with the city, he said, helping with logistics. But what I found most interesting in spending time at their warehouse and distribution center where all of these donations were coming in, just endless boxes of food and clothing. This was all, this all derived from the church's own historic network of donors and foundations that have always helped the church that are stepping up extra to help the migrant crisis here in Chicago, Ellison. All right. NBC News correspondent Mara Barrett in Chicago. Thank you. Coming up, the holiday spirit is going virtual at the California State Capitol this year. We'll explain when we go out west for the headlines. But first, you've got to see this. No, that isn't a cat stuck in a tree. It's a 70-pound German Shepherd. The 10-month-old dog named Luna went missing Sunday morning in Lotus, California. After a day-long search, her owner found her on Monday 25 feet up in a steep, angled pine tree and went up a 24-foot ladder to rescue her. The owner of Luna says he believes Luna got so high up after chasing a squirrel, 
Who would have guessed a dog could climb trees? They really can do anything. We will be back right after the break. Welcome back. Here are some of the stories happening out west that we're following. SAG-AFTRA members have finally approved their contract with Hollywood Studios. And despite some members being unhappy with the AI protections in the final contract, SAG-AFTRA President Fran Drescher called the deal a, quote, golden age for the union. The contract will be active for the next three years until it expires in the summer of 2026. A man living at a homeless camp in Portland drowned. Authorities say he was swept away in a nearby creek as a result of the heavy rains and storms in the area. A large homeless camp sits in the woods near the creek's bank. And California moved their holiday tree lighting ceremony online because of possible protest. Governor Gavin Newsom's office says the decision was made with safety and security of guests in mind. His office did not specify what type of protest they were talking about. A string of shootings across Austin and San Antonio, Texas, all tied to one person. The shooting spree killed six people and injured three, including two police officers. Police say the suspect, 34-year-old Shane James, was taken into custody last night and is now facing several capital murder charges. But officials say they did not link the incidents until after his arrest. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky has more. Tonight in Texas, police pouring over five crime scenes spanning eight hours. They say are all connected to a single gunman. We strongly believe one suspect is responsible for all of the incidents. Authorities identifying the suspect as Shane James, a 34-year-old now charged with capital murder, who served in the Army as an infantry officer as recently as 2015. Investigators say his shooting spree began Tuesday morning at an Austin high school. AISD officer apparently has been shot. EMS is in round. James opening fire on a school resource officer wounding him. Inside the school, teacher Glenn Stewart knew this wasn't a drill. You hear lockdown over the intercom. Yes. What goes through your head? Just keep the kids safe. Just take action, protect the kids mainly. No students were harmed, but nearby, less than an hour later. Thought I heard something like fireworks or something. Pop, pop, pop. A shooting in South Austin, leaving two dead followed just hours later by another shooting. Police reporting a cyclist wounded near a highway. Finally, Tuesday evening, a crucial burglary call. Officer needs assistance. Officer needs assistance. Has shots fired on a burglary. Police arresting James after they say he shot an officer and killed two more people. And late today, San Antonio authorities connecting James to another homicide 60 miles away. A couple found dead in James' apartment. These are believed to be the parents of the suspect that's currently in custody in Travis County. Six alleged murders, and tonight, still no known motive. The wonderful people. Every time I talk about it, I, it hurts me. The wonderful people. He's a good man. Today, New Mexico's attorney general filed a civil lawsuit against Meta and its CEO, Mark Zuckerberg. The lawsuit alleges that both Instagram and Facebook are breeding grounds for sexual exploitation and that they have failed to protect children from predators. Quote, our investigation into Meta's social media platforms demonstrates that they are not safe spaces for children, but rather prime locations for predators to trade child pornography and solicit minors for sex. In response, Meta put out this statement saying, Quote, we use sophisticated technology, hire child safety experts, report content to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and share information and tools with other companies and law enforcement, including state attorneys general, to help root out predators. NBC's technology correspondent Jake Ward joins us now with more on this. So, Jake, this lawsuit, it hinges on an undercover investigation. What do we know about that? Well, Elson, uh, this one is very dark. And for anyone out there, uh, you know, who may be sensitive about this, I just want to warn you, it's tough stuff. So what investigators did here essentially was dress up an account as if it belonged to a 13-year-old girl named Issa B, claiming to be from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and basically just sort of put her out onto Facebook, uh, posting photographs of her. And very, very quickly, she attracted thousands of adult followers who deluged her with inappropriate communications, including 
including about three to four times a week, receiving all sorts of horrifically sexual uh, imagery, videos, and so forth as direct messages. So all of this uh, leading, in part, uh, the investigators to conclude here, as they put it, that Meta has allowed Facebook and Instagram to become a marketplace for predators in search of children upon whom to prey, Ellison. So, Jake, what else does this lawsuit allege, and how does the AG say Meta creates this quote-unquote safe space for sexual exploitation? You know tech so well. Are there ways for companies to stop this, and are they not doing that? Right. Well, the AG here is one of many who is starting to look at the way that social media in general serves as a way of, of putting like-minded folks together. It's a way uh, for people to find one another, find audiences that they want for their products, but also find the people they want to prey on. Um, what they essentially allege here is that the company essentially ran around its own underage protections. And an underage, we should you know, remind everybody here, Ellison is you know, considered 13 on the internet even though it's 18 in real life, that's mostly an industry set standard. You know, it claims that they failed to implement those protections. It also singles out Mark Zuckerberg, the head of Meta, for uh, being personally responsible for product decisions that aggravated risks to children on Meta's platforms, Ellison. So, Jake, we read some of Meta's statement, their response to this. They have said that they disabled more than 500,000 accounts for violating child sexual exploitation policies. How else is the company defending itself here. Well, the company basically says that it operates at enormous scale and is working very hard to combat this. Um, they say they have violated, they've uh, removed 16,000 groups since this summer that violated child safety policies, uh, more than 250,000 devices on Instagram blocked, 500,000 accounts disabled for violating child sexual exploitation policies, and in that case, just in one month alone. I mean, the problem here, Ellison, is one of scale. This is a company with more than 3 billion daily users, and so... Of course, at that scale, they say, you know, all sorts of bad behavior happens. They say they're working tirelessly to fight it. You know, the other thing to remind you just about the scale of this place, right? This is a company that just this past quarter cleared, uh, you know, hundreds, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't want to misquote it. I, I, you know, it's billions and billions and billions of dollars, an enormous amount of money. And so the question also is going to be for this AG and all other AGs who pursue something like this is just what kind of punishment can you level against a company that would actually make a difference to something that size. Ellison. All right. Well, I know you will stay on top of it for us. NBC's Jake Ward, thank you. That does it for us tonight. I'm Ellison Barber. We will see you tomorrow, but until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.